Turn with me, of course, this morning to James. James chapter 4, verse 11 through 12 is what we're focusing on this morning. James 4, 11 through 12. Before we get into the word, let's start with some prayer. Father, would you speak to us through your words this morning? Lord, we are a people often to uh, make judgments of others and sometimes in a condescending way. Uh, it's so easy for us to do that. Uh, Lord, and you know that, so that's why you address it over and over in your word. Lord, help us to handle this accurately, apply it to our lives. Pray that it would glorify you. And Lord, we thank you that thousands of years later in our context, Lord, that this today, our culture, that this still speaks today. It is exactly what we need. And so, Lord, fill us up and make us more like yourself. Amen. Amen. James chapter 4, verse 11 through 12. I think that's around page 1013 in your pew Bible. It says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? So uh, my kids were walking uh, through the neighborhood one time, and they heard, they heard some uh, neighbor kids say, oh, that's those church kids, and uh, kind of in a, in a condescending way, you know, and, and, they, and they, ever since then, they, they se- seem to bring that up a lot to me, you know, like, Oh, Dad, those are those kids that don't like us. You know, I'm like, guys, be nice to them, you know. Like, just try to, try to be kind to them. They probably have some kind of poor stereotype of Christians, right? Maybe their parents told them that Christians are judgmental and they think they're better than everybody else and they're hypocrites. That's what we hear a lot, right? You kind of just get used to this constant uh, over and over again, the same phrases and cliche phrases about Christians. And, and, and the question is, why do people believe that? Why, is that true? Why is there that stereotype out there? It's definitely not all true, not my experience in church for the most part. But is there some truth to it? Uh, our missionary, a uh, guy from Mission of Hope last week came and uh, it was neat. I think there was about 19 people from Riverside that picked up kids to support monthly uh, in Haiti. And John Short was encouraged by that. And we were talking afterwards and, and he started talking about his, his up. He says, I never know what to think when I go to a Baptist church. I just never know what to think. Because there's so many different types of Baptists, aren't there? So many different types. He said, see, my upbringing in a Baptist church was a very fundamental, uh, uh, super hyper-conservative Baptist church. And he said, you know, I didn't, I didn't really get the feel that, that grace was, was something that we gave to one another growing up. He said, I, and I asked him to kind of uh, explain some more on that. He said, you know, for an example, there was a young woman who became pregnant one time. And the church, she stopped being invited to things. And she would get those kind of snide looks from people and... In a subtle way, he said, over time, it was just made known to her that she was not welcome. And he said, those are the kinds of things that I remember. He said, one time there was a guy in a band who had uh, tattoos, you know, sleeves, tattoos on his arms. And uh, he came to know Christ at our church. And he said, we were all, everybody was so excited that, you know, a real bad sinner came to know Christ at our church. And, 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 he, and he said... Uh, but the sad thing was, over time, that they just tried to change him to make their church still look clean and neat and all of that. And so they, he said, you know, whenever he was, because he was in a band, so he started playing in, in, up in church. I don't know if it was guitar or what it was, but he said that they had him like, you know, wear, make sure he wore long sleeves to cover up those tattoos and and, and, and he had some longer hair, make sure you cut that hair. And there were just all these things that he had to do. And it was like, man, people just, they don't accept me for who I am as, 
uh, and, and some of my scars from my past or whatever it may be. And he said it just kind of, it kind of set a bad tone for me. You know, I invited my neighbors to church recently and they said, what kind of Baptist church do you go to? I mean, this has like been over and over again lately. I've had so many people go, what, what kind of, and the, and the lady said, you know, I went to a Baptist church when I, was, when I was younger and it was like, you know, you had to wear dresses and you, you know, everybody had to wear a dress, all the women had to wear dresses and, and it was just very intense, she said, just really intense. And so, um, you know, I was explaining to her about Riverside and, and it's just sad that that is the stereotype that is out there. Actually, many churches have changed their name and taken Baptists out of their name. You've probably noticed that. I have a friend of mine, his church took Baptists out of their name, and I was like, why did you do that? I said, because sometimes we have people come to our church because they know what Baptists believe, and so they come to our church because we're a Baptist church, and they know our theology decently. And I said, I don't know why you would take Baptists out of your name. And he said, well, because of that stereotype out there. He said, we, don't, we want people who are unsaved to feel welcome at our church and sometimes just that name puts a bad uh, feeling out there to the community and I thought wow I never even thought about it that way. Riverside has of course chosen to keep our name and our hope is that we would change that stereotype that's out there. That we would change that stereotype of what people think when they think of Baptist. Now, of course, there's many people have awesome experiences in Baptist churches, but then you have across the board everything that's out there. And a lot of it is this feeling of, of judgment and legalism and intense looking down on other people as if they are lesser. And what do we see in Scripture? We don't see that at all. Since I'm picking on Baptist today, I should probably tell you where Baptist came from. Uh, so this is just si this side note. This isn't from the text, right? But Baptist actually came out of the Church of England. They separated from the Church of England because the Church of England was uh, believed mainly it was infant over infant baptism. It was, it was they believed in infant baptism. So the Baptists separate because they believe in believers' baptism, which is. Uh, which the scripture clearly teaches that when somebody believes in Christ and they are baptized, representing what God has done in their life, that the Holy Spirit has cleansed them and baptized them spiritually and cleansed them. And they were convicted. Now they also believe John Smith was one of the first pastors of the Baptist churches and he believed that in, in uh, infant, uh, infants going to heaven, passages like uh, where uh, David in the Old Testament said about his son that had died, I, he can't come to me, but I will go to him. There's this, there's this theology, this belief that children uh, go to heaven where there's an age of accountability, where they, they, they can't understand and they go to heaven. So uh, that was one of the reasons why there was infant baptism, because you got to baptize them to get them saved. And they separated because of that, but they also had a lot of other reasons why they separated. They believed in the uh, autonomy of the local church, Accountable to Christ and the scriptures only. Sola scriptura, sola Christ. They believed in, in Jesus as the head of the church. Colossians 1.8 says that Christ is the head of the church. So that's why they separated off. And, and, and those are good things. Those are good things. But so often because of our carnal nature and how we treat people, we can give Baptist or church or Christians a bad name. And it's not just Baptists, it's Christians in general. And every denomination has those stereotypes, do they not? And it's sad that that is the case because we see in Scripture a calling out of that. And so what is James saying here? What is he saying when he's referring to judgment and do not judge others? And he's, he re equates that with speaking evil against one another. Is judgment always bad? first question we need to ask is, what is James not saying? What is he not saying here? Based on the context, based on the, the whole of James and, the, and the, also the context of Scripture. He's not saying that anything goes, so don't ever rebuke or correct someone. He's not saying that. Because he does that a lot in James, does he not? He rebukes, he corrects over and over again. In fact, uh, in, in verse 4 of this very chapter, so we look at the immediate context here, verse 4, he says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? 
man, today, don't judge. That's our culture, right? Don't judge. You call me, a, you're saying that I, I am adulterous? He rebukes the people. And then he also says in 2, verse 9, he calls them convicted as transgressors because they show partiality to the rich over the poor. That they're convicted as sinners in doing that. So James doesn't mince his words throughout uh, the book of James. Obviously, it's not wrong to correct or rebuke um, because that would mean that James would be sinning and then he's telling him these people not to judge or rebuke. How do we know that James is not doing that in a condescending way? Looking down on these people. How do we know he's not doing it in a self-righteous kind of way? Well, look at what he says in this verse. He calls them brothers. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. He equates them right on the same level of himself. Brothers. He's not looking down on them as like this horrible person. He's saying, you're sinning. You're you're committing really adultery against God by, 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 by being friend with the world and its philosophies and its way of living and its hedonism and all of that. You're just living for the world and trying to have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And he says, you can't do that. He's rebuking them because of his love. Really, his desire is to bring them up out of from where they're at and to help restore them. He loves them for who they are as brothers in the faith, but he, but he loves them so much that he doesn't allow them to stay where they're at, and he wants to see them grow, is what we see as the example in James. There's other texts that speak to this as well. John 7, 24. John 7, 24 says this, Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Don't make assumptions. Don't just judge by appearances, but judge correctly. It doesn't say don't ever, ever judge or make a judgment on somebody's behavior. It's saying, listen, judge correctly. Make sure you're judging righteously and rightly. 1 Corinthians 5.12 says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Saying to actually judge those inside the church. Uh, Robert Gundry said this in a book that he wrote, A Survey of the New Testament. He says, acceptance and non-judgmentalism is necessary for good community. Listen, non-judgmentalism and acceptance of people and loving people and when somebody commits a sin, you don't do this to them, you embrace them, you run to them and you help them get through whatever they're getting, they're, they need to get through in life. You need that. You need that for healthy community. People need to feel loved and accepted no matter what. And then he says this. However, do not let it go so far as to break down that community by erasing the boundary between it and the world of non-disciples. I love that. And he's actually commenting in this, in this part of, of the book, of his book that he writes, the, um, a survey of the New Testament. He's a- actually commenting on Jesus' words, how Jesus would separate and divide, did he not? He who has ears, let him hear. The rich man came to him, he said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. I mean, it was like he purposely turned some people away, Jesus did. They asked him, why do you speak in parables? He said, so that they would never be hearing and never understanding. He's just like, these guys, we do not want these guys in the fold because they're like wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus knew. Now, of course, I'm not going to go around and say, you know, you know, sell everything you have and give it to the poor to some guy. At least I, I, don't, I don't think, unless I really, really, really knew, like 100%. Jesus knew the guy's heart, right? Jesus knew the guy's heart. And so he spoke to that. He wanted him to forsake it all so that he came with the right, repentant heart. And gave up all of those idols in his life. And so, uh, Robert uh, Gundry is, is uh, commenting on that. That Jesus did this on purpose because he didn't want the, it to be mixed. He wanted it to be a fine line. Because Jesus spoke non-judgment and love and grace and mercy and accepting anyone, even in their darkest sin, especially if they were humble and bra- only if they were humble and broken. But he also didn't mince words on sin issues and people wanting to hold on to a sin 
and come to Jesus with, you know, what can I do to inherit eternal life as long as I don't have to give up this? As long as I don't have to give up whatever it is, right? Jesus hammered that out. He knew exactly where they were coming from, and he spoke very, very harshly against that kind of living. But yet he spoke with grace and mercy. So you see this, 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 this Jesus that kind of steps on our toes, but then there's some things. It's like one, day, one minute he's giving grace and mercy to somebody, the next minute he's just telling them to go away. So there's this, there's this tension there that we need to be able to accept and ask God to help us with that. How do we be careful that we are not judging and speaking evil against someone? Because that's what he's saying. Don't speak evil and don't judge others. How do we do this? How do we be careful? Everyone is so sensitive today, right? So sensitive. In fact, the, there was something went viral on the internet not too long ago. It was this little uh, beep uh, uh, just joke. It was hilarious. It was like this little uh, fake beeping sound that you could put on your horn and communicate to people around you when you needed to beep your horn at them. Like they didn't turn at a light or they didn't see the light was green because they're on their phone. And it had like this southern accent, you know, would you please move to the side or, or could you please hurry up? Could you please make a left turn? Thank you. That's like, it was instead of a beep, it said that. Just hilarious. And I thought, that's exactly where we're at. We, we're just so afraid to offend anybody. And that's in our culture today. We're so afraid to ever speak the truth to somebody because, man, you might get, you know, somebody flip you off. You might get somebody really angry at you. You might get, make an enemy. Somebody might stab you in the back, gossip about you over and over again. So you're going to offend people no matter how gentle you are at times. So how do you know, if you're going to offend people, how do you know when someone gets all upset that the problem is not with you? How do you know? Because if we gauge it on, if I, I won the person over, the person accepted that they said something wrong or did something wrong, I'm right. If we gauge it on that, then th that's not consistent. That's not going to work, is it? Because you, you could be right and totally offend somebody and they get so angry and they, they just... Give up on your friendship and all of that. The scriptures have a lot to say about. So let's go to the scriptures on this. A couple things, a couple pointers to, to recognize here. Do not assume. Do not assume. Assumptions always hurt relationship. Do not assume. And we see that throughout scripture. Proverbs 18, 13. I love this one. It says, it is foolish to jump to conclusions before investigating the facts. You hear one little snippet of truth and you don't hear from the, the other side and you make a judgment on that person. And what that does is that comes across like, like you are looking at the person as lesser in some way. Like you're, you're ready to make a judgment on them, a negative judgment, instead of listening to the whole story. So let's not make assumptions. The story of the uh, alabaster jar is a good one on this. Luke 7, 36 through 50. Many of you know this story where this woman comes to Jesus, a sinful woman in the house of a Pharisee. And she comes to him and she anoints his feet with oil and, and, and this alabaster jar. And she's pouring this perf actually it's perfume on Jesus, expensive perfume. And she's just loving on Jesus. And the Pharisee looks at her and he goes, if Jesus knew that this woman was a sinful woman. He would not allow her to, to even touch him. And Jesus, of course, rebukes the Pharisee and tells him that, that really those who have been given much love much. And those who have been forgiven little love little. So he teaches through that story. But it's a perfect example of someone who labels somebody a sinner and makes a judgment and doesn't look at what is really going on and look at their heart and investigate what's really happening. It's just, that, that's a sinner. It's an assumption type of, an, of a judgment. And we need to be very, very careful that we do not do that. Speaking evil of that person, looking down on that person. Second is we need to clean up our own mess first. Clean up our own mess first. This is taught throughout Scripture. Romans 2, 1. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, 
practice the very same thing. Have you ever had someone do this? This is the most frustrating thing. When somebody comes and calls you out on something and you know that is exactly what they do all the time. Isn't that the most frustrating thing? It's like, I mean, it's very, very hard to listen to that person. Even if there's a little bit of truth in what they're saying or there's a lot of truth in what they're saying, you can't even hear it because they do the very same thing. So Romans is calling us out to not do this. And over and over we see this. Jesus says, Matthew 7, 5, First take the beam out of your own eye, then you will be able to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So you can see clearly to remove that out of your brother's eye. First deal with your own mess, then go to the, to the person with the issue and gently restore that person. Gently restore that person. This doesn't always come easy or natural, does it? Especially when that person has hurt us or hurt a family member in some way. Our, our reaction is not to be gentle. Our reaction is to be like a bull in a china shop, is it not? But the scriptures teach us to gently restore. And when we've cleaned up our own mess on the issue, when we've cleaned up our own mess, we see our own sin for what it is, we've experienced the amazing grace of God. We talked about this this last Sunday. Man, it was a beautiful thing to see people from our church, young, old, people that have gone to this church for years and years and years come forward and just humble themselves from the Lord and say, I need you, Jesus. I need your grace. That was a beautiful thing to see. Because so often, it happens in churches, I think, where people, you know, they think, I, I, I've gone to church my whole life, I, I don't really need to go forward. That's for the sinners, that's for the, the people outside the church. No, it's not. It's for all of us at times in our life. At times in our life, to humble ourselves before the Lord and say, I need you. And when we do that, when we, clean, we let God clean us up and show us our sin for what it is, we're more gentle with other people because we have been there. We're just, just there, just maybe even recently, just yesterday, God showed me something that, I'm, that I was wrong in saying or wrong in doing or a heart issue. If we keep short accounts with God, we walk around as humble people, reliant on the grace of God daily in our lives. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted as well. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. The law of Christ. Notice how he says, you who are spiritual. Not, not you who think you've arrived and got it all figured out. You who are spiritual. And what is spiritual? Spiritual is Blessed are the poor in spirit. Realizing, Jesus said, poor in spirit. Realizing, I, I am poor in spirit. I need Jesus in my life. I'm, I've humbled myself. I've cleaned up my own mess. I've let God clean it up. And I am humble because I know that it's only by God's grace in me that he has fixed this issue in my life. And so I go to that person in a very gentle way, knowing that we are on the same level. And there's no condemnation, especially when we're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. James is talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. We know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it's just bringing that person up back and restoring them back to who they are and reminding them of who they are. So we restore in gentleness and we keep watch. We keep watch. Over ourselves, that we are tempted. Because in the midst of conflict, in the midst of dealing with some kind of conflict issue with another person, isn't it easy to be tempted? Isn't it easy to, to, to get angry ourselves? Isn't it easy to get defensive? Isn't it easy when they don't respond the way that we think they should to try to push the issue farther and control that person more and more and more? And we need to let that go and let God do his work? It is so easy to do that. So be careful. Keep watch over yourselves. In Galatians, Paul says, lest you be tempted as well and bear with one another's burdens. Carry one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ because we know Christ carried our burdens and set us free by carrying our burdens. The law of Christ has set us free. 
and be active. Actively pursue. Don't give people the silent treatment. When you know there's an issue, if you know there's any issue between you and somebody else, or you even think there might be an issue, it's important to ask them, are we, are we good? Even if it's just something little. Hey, did I, did, I offend, did I offend you at all? I have to do that sometimes when I watch the Buckeyes. You know, I'm at somebody else's house and I'm getting all riled up. Am I getting too riled up? I'm sorry. It's just something little, right? Sometimes it's just something little and sometimes it's something big. And we have to constantly keep that, that short account with that person. Be active in pursuing that relationship. And if they've hurt us in some way and they know that they have, then we need to go to that person for the goal of seeking to restore them in not a judgmental, condescending way. The danger of judging, that's what he gets into here at the end, the last part of this section of James. It says, uh, if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And he talks about speaking evil against the law and judging the law. What is he saying here? Speaking evil against the law and judging the law? If we're judgmental to somebody else, we're a judge of the law? I kind of wrestled with this one. What, what, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I thought back to James 2, 12 through 13. We've already uh, uh, spent some time on this passage, so I don't want to spend too much on it here this morning. But it says, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The law of liberty. The law of liberty, we know, is the law of Christ. The only way the law liberates is through Christ. That's the only way it liberates. It shows us our sin. It's like that mirror shows us our sin and shows us our need. It's like the the CAT scan at the doctor's office showing us that we need some treatment in some way. And we know who the treatment is and that's Christ. So that law points us to Christ and Christ cleans us up. And that's the law of liberty. It sets us free. It cleans us. The law of liberty through grace in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I meant to put this on the screen for you, but I didn't get, uh, didn't get to it this week. To be speaking on behalf of God's law and speak condemning or evil of another person You speak evil against the law and turn people away from the intended purpose of the law, which is to bring freedom. When we condemn and we judge, we're we're, we're missing the whole point. We're missing, we're we're condemning that person. Instead, we should be wanting to restore them back to Christ, back to a reconciled relationship with God. We are ambassadors of reconciliation reconciling people to God. And when we condemn and judge and give the silent treatment and push people away, we are, we are destroying what the purpose of the law is even for. So we're speaking evil against the law and people will get a bad taste of God's laws and God's goodness. Will they not? Oh, I don't, the Bible, this is just judgment. Those people just look down on people. It shouldn't be that way. It should be, the Bible restores, the Bible gives me life The Bible helps me, guides me in this life that I don't know how to do it on my own, that I'm constantly distracted by all these things, and they just just come up dry. And so I need the life of God's Word. Instead, people go, ah, that's just judgment. And they miss the whole point. It liberates. It gives freedom. So may we be people who help paint that picture, and not this picture of evil and judgment and in the wrong sense of the word judgment. Uh, the last uh, passage I'd like to go to here, and, and this is really what he says is, you're putting yourself in the place of God. There's only one lawgiver and judge who's able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? And so when we put ourselves as above other people in a judgmental kind of way, we actually are putting ourselves in the place of God. And there's a real uh, cool a story of Jesus with the sons of thunder where they do this and Jesus rebukes them. So if you want to, you can turn to Luke 9, 51 through 55 with me real quick here. This is a very interesting story, okay? We know that the Samaritans, that, that, that the Jews 
really, really did not like, and, and I know hate's a strong word, but in a sense hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. This is racism back in, you know, first century racism here. Classic first century racism. They can't stand each other. There's a whole story uh, that, that goes way back to when uh, the Jews were taken out of their homeland and the temple was destroyed. They were taken to Babylon and, and there were some Jews that were left behind. Okay. Then when the Jews came back, they were sent back, they found out that these, these Jews that were left behind, the Samaritans, had, had intermarried with all of the, the, the people that, that the uh, Babylonian king had sent into that, into that area. And so they had started to worship idols, and, and, and really they, their, their belief was all messed up. And so when the Jews came back to the homeland, they're excited to get back to the homeland, and then they find these people that are worshiping idols, and they're like probably... Oh, 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 snap. We, we were over here in, in, in Babylon worshiping God, and we come back to our homeland, and you guys are worshiping idols? And they just had this disdain for them. Then they tried to rebuild their temple, and the Samaritans wanted to help rebuild the temple, and they said, no, we don't want your dirty hands touching our temple. So get out of here. So the Samaritans decided that they were going to worship God uh, on, on their own mountain in Samaria. And so the Jews worshipped God, of course, in the temple in Jerusalem. And here, the, here Jesus is with his disciples, and they're headed to Jerusalem. Verse 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you, want to, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he returned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. I'd love to know how he rebuked them. What did Jesus say to these disciples in this moment? I, I would just love, I mean, I, I want to I say what maybe I would have said, but it probably wasn't what Jesus said, Right? But what he said to these, to these disciples, he rebuked them because they were so focused on their, their disdain for the Samaritans. Oh, they are not allowing us to stay here. Again, I'm just, I cannot stand these Samaritans. Lord, just, can, we just, can you just deal with them now? Let's not wait till the end times. Can you just burn them up now? And Jesus, of course, rebukes them because they're trying to put themselves in the place of God and judge, bring judgment down, and wish evil upon someone else. And that's when you really know that, you, I mean, it is clear as day that your judgment towards somebody is completely selfish and carnal, is when you want something evil to happen to that person. When you really want them to just have a rotten day. When you really want God to just do something bad to them, instead of wanting them to come back to Jesus. Who is it that we tend to condemn? Who is it? Is it those fundamental ultra-conservative Christians, legalistic Christians? Do we condemn them and look down on them and want bad things to happen to them and want their church to die? Is it those charismatics, those, those charismatics that just go crazy and jump in the aisles and they make us all look bad? Do we want bad things to happen? Do we judge them in a condemning kind of way? How about those hyper-Calvinist I know I'm getting kind of deep here, but hyper-Calvinists, you know, the five-point tulip people, you know, just get them out of here. Get them out of the church. Condemn them. How about those Catholics? We condemn them. Do we look down on them? How about those more liberal, seeker-sensitive Christians? Do we look down on them? Do we condemn them? Friends, it's up to God to judge. Let's love. Let's give grace. Let's give mercy. Yes, there's truth. Yes, there's right or wrong. But it's how we communicate to the person. Are we assuming? Are we being gentle? Are we cleaning up our own mess? That will help us be gentle.